Okay. Uh, good morning. If, if everyone could take their seats, um, I'd like to welcome you to the first plenary session of this meeting. There's been a little bit of a change in the schedule because of travel issues. Um, Dr. Passanelli, who's receiving the Sonia Scarlatis Award, will not be here till tomorrow. So we're going to move that award to the Presidential Symposium. And in this session, we're going to pre present the Excellence in Research Awards and then hear the George Stamatinopoulos Lecture. So I'd like to start by presenting the Excellence in Research Awards, which I'm going to do with the help of Dr. Michelle Kalos, who's the incoming ASGCT pres president. And these awards are for the trainees who had the highest scoring abstracts. So I'm going to read out the names, and then Michelle and um, David Barrett will present the awards. So the first awardee is Jessica Seiler from the German Cancer Research Center for her abstract entitled Wild Type and Recombinant AAV Mitochondrial Integration and Trafficking. The next awardee is Claire Dominger from University Hospital for her abstract entitled Post-Transcriptional Fine-Tuning of AAV Vector Gene Expression for Haemophilia A Gene Therapy. <laughs> next, we have Annika Evans from Rice University, characterization of a protease activatable adeno-associated virus vector for disease-targeted gene delivery. Bence Georgi from Harvard Medical School, allele-specific deafness gene disruption through discrimination of a single base change by Staph aureus Cas9-KKH prevents progressive hearing loss after AAV-mediated gene delivery. <laughs> Megan Kaiser, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Translating RNAi for Huntington's disease, intraputaminal delivery of AAV1, MIHDS1 for comprehensive dosing, biodistribution, silence and safety in a non-human primate model. <laughs> Shane Kurakara from the Mayo Clinic, the innate immune system as a determinant for response to measles vi virotherapy. Paul Macciocha from University College London, a simple protein-based method for generation of off-the-shelf allogeneic chimeric antigen receptor T-cells. <laughs> Victoria Madigan, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, RNF121 is a key transcriptional regulator of AAV genome expression. Mario Mitic, University of Florida, structure function characterization of non-primate AAB capsids for their usage as therapeutic gene delivery vectors. <laughs> Michaela Milani, San Rafael Telethon Institute for Gene Therapy, liver-directed gene therapy for haemophilia B with immune stealth lentiviral vectors. Uh, Richard O'Neill, Vanderbilt University, transposon modified T lymphocytes for sustained erythropoietin delivery in vivo. <laughs> Simon P Pecoray, Shepin's Eye Institute in Nantes University, probing capsid mosaics formation in AAV library preparations. Jane Rasaya, um, UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health, 3CAR gene edited anti CD3 chimeric antigen receptor T cells. <laughs> Adele Riccardi from Yale University in utero gene correction mediated by PNA nanoparticles.
and finally Keisuke Watanabe, University of Pennsylvania, combined mesothelin redirected chimeric antigen receptor T cells with cytokine armed oncolytic adenoviruses for the treatment of pancreatic cancer. And I'd like to congratulate all the awardees for their accomplishments, which I think reflect the diversity of the field, and also apologise for the New Zealand pronunciation of some of their names. Okay, congratulations all. I think some of you have spoken already, and we'll be hearing from some of you in the plenary session tomorrow. So it's a great pleasure now to introduce the George Stamatinopoulos Lecturer. This lecture is named after the founding president of ASGCT and is one of the highest honours that the society can bestow. And I think it's very appropriate in the 21st year of the society, the year I think in which it came of age, that Cathy High will be giving this lecture because I think the journey that she'll describe really mirrors the field. Cathy is an accomplished physician scientist who began her career studying the molecular basis of blood coagulation and development of novel therapeutics for the treatment of bleeding disorders. I think she very rapidly became interested in using gene therapy to achieve this goal and undertook a series of iterative bench-to-bedside studies um, optimizing gene therapy for haemophilia. And along the way, she had to overcome some obstacles and learn about immunology and optimize delivery systems. And during her academic career, she um, was a Howard Hughes investigator, elected to the National Academy of Medicine, and was also president of this society about 15 years ago. She served as the director of the Centre for Cellular and Molecular Therapeutics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where she conducted her initial clinical studies and then to move the strategies to late phase um, testing, moved to Spark Therapeutics, where she serves as president. And I think this journey culminated late last year in the first approval by the FDA of an AAB product to treat an inherited genetic disease. Cathy's talk is entitled, Turning Genes into Medicine, Therapeutics for the New Millennium. Okay, thanks, Helen, for that uh, very nice introduction. Uh, as you see, I've entitled this Turning Genes into Medicines, and whenever I say that at Spark, the CEO reminds me that we're trying to turn genes into a business. But um, Okay, so uh, my first slide is my disclosure slide, since Spark is a publicly traded company. And if you want more detail than is available here, you are welcome to look at our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. So I have to start out by saying a word or two about George Stamatoyanopoulos, uh, who is a very distinguished geneticist at the University of Washington, as all of you know. And uh, when I was first elected president of ASGCT, and my term started in 2004, George Stam emailed me ahead of time and told me that he needed to talk to me at the meeting. And he came up to me in a very serious tone of voice. He said, I need to tell you two important things. And the first is that uh, you need to buy a notebook, and you need to keep notes about the society in this notebook. Issues, problems, solutions. And he said, so I thought, okay, that's a good idea, and I did do that. And then the second thing he told me is, in this year, every morning when you wake up, the first thing you should think about is, what can I do today to make the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy better? So I do have to say that, George, I'm not sure I did that one. Um, but... He was a, a very inspiring leader and somebody who really cared very deeply, who cares very deeply about our society and who shepherded it through times that were more difficult than what we see today. So in this uh, talk, I thought that I would talk briefly about several issues, highlights from uh, the approval of our first AV product here in the U.S., some thoughts about our work in gene therapy for hemophilia, and then close with some discussion of where I think gene therapy finds itself in 2018. And I want to start out by reminding you that, as Francis Collins told us at a, a George Stem lecture a number of years ago, 
The Human Genome Project formed a very important substrate for efforts in gene therapy. And as Francis said at the beginning of the Human Genome Project, uh, his goal was that this would eventually lead to better treatments for people who were born with serious genetic diseases. As you know, the Human Genome Project began in 1990, and by coincidence, the first approved clinical trial of gene therapy began in the same year at the NIH in a trial for ADA SCID. And those efforts took a little longer than the work that went on in the Human Genome Project, but 22 years later, uh, the first gene therapy was approved by a regulatory agency in the Western world, uh, and that was uh, what is now Unicure's product, Glybera, uh, an AAV product for a rare form of lipid disorder. So this timeline of about two decades in clinical development is really similar to other novel classes of therapeutics like bone marrow transplantation and even monoclonal antibodies. Um, I want to point out that the history of gene therapy profoundly influenced the development of Vareta gene, Niparvovec, or Luxterna, uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, but um, as you know, the first decade of clinical gene therapy was uh, characterized by a number of studies for a wide range of diseases, and typically uh, the findings reported were safe, uh, but not efficacious. And for me, a particularly exciting time was the end of that first decade when the trials of gene therapy for hemophilia began in 1998 and 1999. As you know, however, at the close of that decade and the beginning of the next decade, uh, there were high-profile adverse events that ended up having a very profound effect on the uh, atmosphere surrounding gene therapy. Uh, first of all, there uh, was a sort of feeling of people outside the field that uh, gene therapy was not really ready for prime time, that there weren't enough problems solved to really allow people to do drug development in the space. And that resulted in a loss of interest and support from large pharmaceutical companies, large biotech companies, and gradually it began to have a knock-on effect on the companies uh, that had formed around the idea of gene therapy, and they began to downsize and contract. And that actually had a very important effect for me because we had been working with a gene therapy company in Northern California who had been supplying the clinical grade vector for our gene therapy trials in hemophilia. And like a lot of other companies, they began to reorient away from uh, the idea of gene therapy. I have to say another um, aspect of all this work for me was that uh, uh, through the years, I have found that if, if I have a fault, it's that I tend to become very closely involved in what I'm doing and not pay attention to the things that were going on around me. And I have to say, I found myself somewhat surprised by the gravity of the situation that occurred uh, in those days of gene therapy. And it was right about that time that I became the president of the American Society of Gene Therapy. And I did a number of interviews with uh, people in the lay press and the scientific press, and I was always trying to emphasize what I considered encouraging information uh, or results that were going on in the field. And no matter how much time I spent with reporters, I uh, recurrently had uh, this kind of experience of uh, that after I spent a long time talking about what I thought was good, that I'd, I would read an article uh, with a title like Gene Therapy, Cursed or Inching Towards Credibility. So it was really in that uh, setting, and for people who weren't there then, it's really hard to uh, completely accurately describe these sort of negative feelings about gene therapy, but it was in that context that I had discovered that I really needed to go to the leadership of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and ask them to let me set up a gene therapy center since our a uh, company partner had decided not to continue to support the work in gene therapy for hemophilia. And so when I look back on uh, the experience that I had then, um, I, I never know which is more surprising. Hmm. I seem to have lost the activity of the pointer. Uh, I mean of the uh, advancer of the slides. This is not good. I think I somehow 
triggered this thing. All right. All right, good. So um, it was really in the context of all that that I went to the CEO of Children's Hospital, who himself was a physician and uh, had been a former colleague on the faculty, and presented the case for his committing resources to furthering gene therapy uh, for genetic disease. And, you know, I, I can never figure out when I look back on it who was uh, more insane, me for asking, uh, he did listen to what I had to say, and his response was, all right, let me think about it. And so I came back a week later, and to my surprise, he actually agreed to commit very substantial resources to gene therapy for genetic disease. And what he said was, all right, you always tell me that there are no problems here that can't be solved. And if that is the case, then gene therapy will be very important for genetic disease, and that means it's important for uh, pediatric hospitals. So I'm going to commit the resources. And so I was very excited because uh, he gave us the resources we needed to set up clinical grade vector production at Children's Hospital and to hire the people that we needed in regulatory affairs and uh, other aspects to really move our work forward. And so then we uh, began the process of trying to recruit uh, individuals to Children's Hospital. And because many of the gene therapy companies were downsizing, we were fortunate to be able to recruit people with a lot of experience. And all we really had to do was convince them that living in Philadelphia was a lot like living in San Francisco. Um, but, but we were successful. He only set one condition on uh, the center, and he said, Dr. Hyde, I don't want you to spend all these resources for hemophilia. You have to work on some other genetic diseases that affect the pediatric population. I considered arguing with him about that, but I decided that given the uh, generosity of his resources, I should take his advice. And so there was really only one program that I was very interested in getting, and that was the work that Jean Bennett and her colleagues at the University of Florida and Cornell had done, establishing very clear proof of concept for a rare inherited retinal dystrophy. So I went to the Department of Ophthalmology and asked Jean if she would be willing to work with us on a clinical trial for uh, gene therapy for this rare inherited retinal dystrophy. And fortunately, she agreed to do that. Uh, I was um, very attracted to this data because she had very clear proof of concept in this naturally occurring dog model of this disease, which was due to autosomal recessive mutations in a gene called RPE65. And I felt then that, you know, given this very strong proof of concept in a large animal model, this would be something that we could move forward. So uh, we began working together in 2005. Jean was always the scientific director of the work, and her husband, Albert McGuire, was the vitreo retinal surgeon who first did this study at CHOP. And uh, we were um, uh, indebted to Jennifer Wellman, who prosecuted a lot of the regulatory work as the trial got underway. And I think that one of the advantages we had for the group, group that was working at CHOP was their long and deep understanding of how product characteristics can influence clinical outcomes. And so the work that we undertook from a preclinical standpoint, oh, um, is outlined here. Jean and the group in her laboratory, including Dr. Jeanette Benicelli, worked to optimize the expression cassette, including optimizing the COSAC sequence. And our group at Children's Hospital made a number of choices around the final formulation. Um, you can do a series of calculations to convince yourself that in the relatively small space of the injection blub, it will be to your advantage to remove empty capsids so that they don't compete with the full capsids of the AAV vector uh, for entrance into the target cells, the retinal pigment epithelial cells. And uh, Fraser Wright directed a series of studies uh, to determine the level of uh, surfactant that we needed in the final formulation to prevent adherence of the vector to product contact surfaces. And we worked out for the trial design a fairly, um, a fairly uh, 
robust regimen of immunomodulatory steroids before and after vector infusion uh, to give ourselves the best chance of success. And through the phase one, two study, Albert McGuire worked to uh, standardize and innovate on the subretinal delivery procedure. And our group at Children's Hospital, who was uh, overseeing the clinical operations and carrying out the work, became a very well-oiled team uh, moving forward with the clinical studies. So how did we get from uh, the initiating the trial in October of 2007 to uh, actual approval of the drug 10 years later uh, in late 2017? Well, again, we were very involved in the work that we were doing, but the gene therapy landscape was actually shifting around us again. And in that second decade of clinical gene therapy, uh, not only were we get, getting positive results, but a number of other groups were as well, both in this uh, rare inherited retinal dystrophy, so this is an article from Robin Ali's group, and, uh, and also in other diseases, so ADA skid, uh, led by the group in Milan, Maria Grazia Roncarolo and her colleagues, and in hemophilia, this was a study from Amit Nathwani and his colleagues both at UCL and at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. So positive results were slowly beginning to accumulate in the field, and really the landscape was changing around us. And in 2012, as I mentioned before, the first AAV gene therapy product was actually licensed uh, by the regulators in Europe. And I think the positive clinical results, as well as this demonstration robustly that a regulatory pathway to approval existed, function to unleash uh, a, a much more availability of capital in the gene therapy space. And this article by Matt Herper at Forbes magazine in uh, early 2014 delineated the number of companies that were forming up and they were actually being able to get access to capital. And so that also affected what we were doing at CHOP and at, uh, and at Penn. And, and part of the reason for that was that these companies, as they formed up, began to try to recruit our staff. And so it, it eventually became clear to me that unless we formed our own company, we were going to lose the great group of individuals who were uh, working together. And uh, the other thing that rapidly became clear to me was uh, CHOP uh, hired a first-rate uh, life sciences consulting company to work out the costs of what they thought it would take to get to the finish line for our first three uh, investigational agents that we were working on in our center at CHOP. And when I saw the financial resources and the personnel requirements for that, I thought that even I, who was really good at writing grants, would never be able to amass the resources uh, without getting access to the public markets and the kinds of capital that they could provide. And so uh, we set up Spark Therapeutics and we, from the beginning, wanted to be a fully integrated company that did everything from the discovery to the clinical development to the manufacturing and to eventually the commercialization of products. And we were fortunate that we were able to attract as the CEO a consultant who had been working with us at CHOP for a number of years, and so he was pretty well familiar with the programs, and so uh, we got to work at CHOP. So let me say a little bit about Luxterna. It is for a rare autosomal recessive disease caused mutation by mutations in RPE65, early onset retinal degeneration with night blindness, a prominent symptom. Some patients do have some vision early in life, most are significantly impaired by the second decade of life, and most progress to complete loss of vision. So prior to the licensing of Luxterna, there was no pharmacologic treatment for this disease, and that has an important implication, which is that uh, there was not universal agreement on the endpoints that would support registration. And so this is an overview of the clinical development program, the phase one, two studies that were done uh, initially, I mentioned, the phase three studies, there were many decisions to be made, and then we had to develop and then validate a novel primary endpoint, as well as most of the natural history data on this disease were case reports from single uh, institutions, and so we also had to undertake to put our results in context 
a natural history study that occurred at seven different referral centers across three continents. We had to get a, a agreement on the statistical analysis plan with the regulators and also, in a very big lift, bring all the AV manufacturing and quality systems to commercial standards. So that was part of the work that we undertook at Spark. So some of the decisions that had to be made about the phase three trial design, uh, which is illustrated here, we ended up using a randomized control trial design. We considered, and for a paired organ like the eye, it's very difficult to resist the temptation to use one eye as the intervention eye and the other as the control eye. It's the perfect control. It has the same mutation. It ha it's at the same stage of degeneration. It's the perfect control. And yet, we knew that uh, nobody would eventually use the product by injecting only one eye. And as I mentioned before, the natural history data was simply not good enough to use that as the control arm. So we had to settle on this randomized control trial design, uh, which so eligible subjects were randomized either to have both eyes injected sequentially or to go into the control arm and uh, do all the same evaluations and these individuals at the end of one year would be allowed to cross over and have both eyes injected. Um, so the end point was the comparison of how uh, the intervention group did at the end of one year to the control group before they crossed over. So the end points in the trial included standard measures of visual function, including full field light sensitivity, FST testing, visual acuity and visual fields, but we also had to work with the regulators to develop a novel endpoint that measured something called functional vision. So uh, I'm proud of the fact that this was actually uh, collaboratively approached by both the sponsor and the regulators. And the point that they wanted to make was that although it's important to track measures of visual function, it was also important to have a measure of functional vision how a person functions in a visually related activity of daily living, which we would essentially describe as a performance output of all of these different aspects of visual function. And there was a need to define an endpoint that could be quantified over a wide range of performance levels because people entered the study uh, at a wide range of levels. And it also had to be something that could, done by, it could be done by pediatric patients and understood. So, the need for this novel endpoint was discussed in depth before we initiated phase three at an advisory committee meeting that the FDA convened. And over a period of uh, months, we talked with both the FDA and the European Medicines Agency about this test. And so the novel primary endpoint was a mobility test, which integrated aspects of visual acuity, visual fields, and light sensitivity. Uh, the reason that the, a new endpoint was needed is that traditional mobility testing doesn't incorporate the effect of the level of environmental illumination on a person's performance in terms of speed and accuracy. So the test essentially is outlined here. At a range of different light levels, the subject is asked to walk through on the arrows, avoiding the obstacles, and we measure both errors and time to complete the course. And so the endpoint is essentially the measurement at the baseline of what is the lowest level at which the person can pass the test on both time and accuracy. And then one year after vector injection, what is the lowest level where they can pass the course. Uh, a number of features were introduced to make this more rigorous and objective. First of all, all of the performances of the video of the mobility test were videotaped, and those videotapes were coded and sent to an independent reading center where independent graders uh, graded both accuracy and the time required to execute the course, and you had to pass on both of those parameters to get a pass. There were 12 different courses, and they were presented to uh, participants in a randomized order to try to mitigate against any learning effect. And at every time point that was assessed, the testing was done at, uh, with the right eye alone, the left eye alone, and under the bilateral testing condition. And this is just an example of a patient uh, executing the course. 
and uh, oh no. <laughs> Can AV start this movie? Oh, good, we're started. Okay. On the right, you see the patient a year after vector injection, and I think you can understand that she is able to execute the course accurately and fairly quickly. And on the right, you see her prior to vector injection at the baseline, and I think, you, again, you can appreciate that, uh, first of all, uh, she frequently is being redirected by the examiners in the room, and that she's also frequently wandering off course. And so uh, it is possible to quantify this test. And if you look at the results in the phase three study, uh, what you can see is that both groups, uh, the intervention group and the control group, started at about the same level, typically able to get a passing score at around 50 lux, the control group changed very little over the course of a year, whereas the intervention group, 30 days after vector injection, was able to pass at a much lower level of light, and they sustained that over the course of the year of observation. At the end of one year, this group crosses over and undergoes bilateral injection of vector, and you can see that they then recapitulate the results in the original intervention group not captured in the way that we assess the test, but also very important, is the uh, observation that people typically in the intervention group greatly shortened the amount of time it took to execute the course, whereas the people in the original control group showed very little change over the course of a year, suggesting that there really isn't a lot of learning effect, and also just making it clear uh, the clinical relevance of something like this can be readily imagined if you consider things like crossing the street. <clears throat> so uh, the trial met uh, statistical significance for the primary endpoint, the first two of the secondary endpoints, and for other endpoints that we studied did not meet statistical significance for a change in visual acuity, although a substantial number of the patients showed improvement in that. The safety in the phase three study really reflected the known uh, risks of the surgical injection procedure, and many of these were transient, uh, a transient increase in intraocular pressure, and uh, some were retinal tears that were repaired at surgery, cataract formation known to occur in this setting. There was one uh, serious event of loss of foveal function in the phase three study, accompanied by retinal thinning, again associated with the injection procedure. And no, <clears throat> no deleterious immune response has occurred. So we were able to publish our studies on um, developing and validating the primary endpoint. We took pains to show the correlation of this uh, performance on this endpoint with more conventional measures like visual acuity and visual fields. And as part of the phase three study, we were actually able to demonstrate a correlation of performance on the mobility test with full field light sensitivity. And that's important because after the product is licensed, it means that physicians can follow the progress of their patients by checking full field light sensitivity, which can be done in the subspecialist office. And it means we don't need to set up mobility tests uh, to assess progress. So a great deal of work was involved in bringing the manufacturing process and all the quality systems required to release the vector to commercial standards, and I can't talk about all of that, but I thought it would be useful to talk about the potency assay because in every talk that I ever went to by the FDA, they always said, start early on the potency assay. And I always thought, how hard could it be? Uh, but anyway, when we were still at CHOP, we had an in vivo potency assay. Uh, so when the vector was made, we took it over to Gene's group and they injected genetically affected mice, and six weeks later performed pupillometry, and if it was positive, then we knew that the batch was uh, effective. But the FDA report repeatedly pointed out that this was not a quantitative assay, and so we did try, while we were still at CHOP, to develop a biochemical assay, and the problem is that the product of the RP65 reaction was present in very low amounts, 
And we really weren't able to do it. So when we went to Spark, we began to tackle how we were going to get this potency assay done. And so the reaction in question is shown here. Um, all transretinol is a product of the reaction that occurs when light strikes the retina, and it eventually has to be regenerated into 11 cis retinol, and that occurs under the activity of two different enzymes, one of which was being supplied by RPE65, uh, the product of our vector, but the other was also a critical enzyme. So we needed to do this in a cell line that we could transduce with our AAV vector, so we used HEK293 cells. But HEK293 cells do not carry this other enzyme, which is also critical. And uh, so we had to use a cell line, a 293 cell line, that had been stably transfected with this other enzyme, lecithin retinol acyl transferase. And so then the uh, vector is introduced into the HEK293 cells, and 72 hours later, the cells are lysed, and now we add the substrate all transretinol, and in addition, to stabilize the product of the reaction, we need this crow bp this bonding protein. So we have to add the substrate, the bonding protein, and by the way, all of these reactions are light sensitive, so yes, you have to do the reactions in the dark. And then this is quenched, and we can measure the product on mass spec. So Dr. Kuto at Spark worked out the general outline of this procedure. And at that point, a senior analytical consultant, Parveen Koshal, took over. And the first problem that we encountered was that the peak of interest, 11 cis retinol, was uh, buried in a shoulder. So the fluid phase and retention times had to be altered to isolate the 11 cis retinol peak so that it could be quantified accurately. We then we're wrestling with the problem of how many multiplicities of infection are needed to really define the curve. Uh, we went back and forth, but finally decided we would opt for the most rigorous approach, nine different MOIs uh, to define the curve. And we eventually ended up with the relative potency assay that you see here in blue is shown the activity of the reference standard, and in green, the test article we tested five different concentrations from 50% of uh, the level of the reference standard to 150%. And fortunately, the potency assay displayed appropriate levels of precision, accuracy, and linearity over the relevant range. And so we had not only a really good potency assay, but something that we could use to analyze variants of unknown significance if we needed to do that subsequently. So our data read out in the fall of 2015. We conducted a pre-BLA meeting with the FDA in March of 2016. And then uh, we began to file the components of the BLA in a rolling submission, uh, the non-clinical data. Uh, a number of months later, we got all the clinical study reports written up in the clinical data. And then finally, uh, the group that was uh, running the CMC uh, was, uh, was working down to the last minute. This is our head of technical operations, Diane Blumenthal, Mark Galbraith, head of QC, uh, Chris Stevens and Berent Hauck in manufacturing, ably assisted by these individuals who are all involved in getting uh, the last parts of the VLA written up and submitted. Uh, in total, it was over 66,000 pages with over 43,000 links. And yes, the regulators did want to see the over 2,000 phase three mobility tests. So we had a poor uh, student working all summer to put those onto encrypted hard drives, and it was all uh, submitted. So one of our taglines at Spark is no rest for the weary. So after the BLA went in, we started receiving an, what seemed like an endless series of information requests from the regulators, and all those uh, had to be answered on a time clock. And we also started to get ready for what we surmised would be an advisory committee hearing around uh, the evaluation of the BLA. So we put together our own presentations and a briefing book. Uh, and then we began to think up all the questions that we might get and to prepare the over 1,000 backup slides that we used on that day. And these three people who had been involved in the program uh, Katie Wachtel, who was in regulatory at Spark, Sarah McCaig in clinical operations at CHOP, and Don Halberstadt, 
began to try to get a grip on these more than 1,000 backup slots so that they could instantly find them during the advisory committee meeting. We rehearsed uh, rather exhaustively. Uh, here you see uh, our, some of the group from Spark, some of our, uh, so Mark Panisi at Oregon Health Sciences University talked about the inherited retinal dystrophy, Steve Russell and Al McGuire, the PIs at CHOP, and of course Jean, who uh, unceasingly worked to make sure that everything was gonna go well on that day. Um, the FDA assembled, I thought, a terrific group. Uh, some of them have been involved in gene therapy for a long time, three of the 16 voting members, but the other 13 were people from other areas that were important for this product. Inherited retinal dystrophies, vitreoretinal retinal surgery, uh, immunology, genetics, biostatistics, low vision testing. They had no particular commitment to gene therapy and they rigorously evaluated the data that were presented that day and they asked what seemed like an unending series of questions and, uh, and so actually a reporter tweeted from the room, uh, Sue Sutter of the pink sheet tweeted from the room early on, all three company presenters are women. I don't ever remember seeing that before. So I thought that was important. And she said, two male external consultants also presenting. Okay, so they were the also rounds. Uh, and by the way, all of our three biostatisticians were also women, so that was important. Anyway, it was an exciting day. And at the end of that, the uh, consultants all voted unanimously to recommend that uh, Lexterna should be approved. And uh, as you know, two months later, the FDA did approve it, so that was very exciting for us. And uh, I think one of the lessons I learned through the work that we did was that taking the most rigorous path is really the right thing to do. In the end, uh, it was important that we develop the novel endpoint. In the end, it was actually good that we undertook the most rigorous trial design for phase three. And as I noted before, the potency assay, though challenging, also gives us a method for analyzing variants of unknown significance. Okay, in the last minutes, I wanna say a little bit about our journey in hemophilia. And hemophilia, as you know, on, uh, reflects a very different set of problems in gene therapy compared to something like Luxterna. In hemophilia, the endpoints are well understood and well accepted based on many, many years of therapy with protein therapeutics. On the other hand, uh, when you put trillions of particles, of vector particles, into the circulation, uh, you can expect that you will not get the free pass from the immune response that we saw when you do subretinal injection of relatively low doses of vector. And so some of the lessons that we learned along the way, I'll say that as a young hematologist uh, many years ago, I was very interested in the prospect of using the genes for factor eight and factor nine to develop better therapeutics for hemophilia. Those genes had just been cloned when I finished my uh, fellowship in hematology. And so one of the first projects that I undertook as a new faculty member was to try to isolate the gene for canine factor nine because the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill had a dog colony of animals with severe hemophilia and I was hoping that if we could isolate this gene, we could uh, start to develop gene therapy. In those days, believe it or not, there was no PCR. So we had to isolate this gene by constructing a cDNA library from canine liver and doing low stringency screen with the, with the human factor IX clone. Now, by the time it was time to develop the, to determine the defect in the hemophilic dogs, at least the concept of PCR was introduced. And so, we actually did this by, by doing PCR using three different water baths and moving the tube every 30 to 60 seconds through the three different water baths. And believe me, as, as tedious as that sounds, it was a lot better than making another library and screening it. And so we were able to find the defect in the hemophilic dogs. And so the next series of studies that we undertook were to try to correct uh, hemophilia B in hemophilic dogs using an AAV vector expressing canine factor nine. And that work was uh, occurred while we were at Children's Hospital and was ably led by Roland Herzog, who is now 
an editor of one of the journals of molecular therapy and runs his own research group in Indiana, mo very recently, um, leaving Florida. Anyway, Roland uh, was able to show in the hemophilic dog model that he could get long-term expression of canine factor nine by introducing the AAV vector either into skeletal muscle or into the liver of the dogs. And so we actually thought that it would be fairly straightforward to move from success in a large animal model to success in people. So we learned a lot of lessons along the way about that. Uh, when we began the first liver trial in 2001, it was a dose escalation study, and we were delivering the vector directly into the hepatic artery in a procedure that was done in the interventional radiology suite. So one of the first important lessons I learned in that was, guess what? Animals do not fully predict all the toxicities observed in humans. And so <clears throat> in our preclinical work in animals, we had not been concerned about vector shedding in the semen because it was negative in the dogs. In the first subject infused in the trial, however, as you can see here on samples done in triplicate, at baseline there was no evidence of vector in DNA extracted from the semen, but at week one all three samples were clearly positive and at week two the result was the same. So, the trial was halted, and we had to try to study more extensively what was the risk of inadvertent germline gene transfer. And I think the important lesson I learned in that setting was that you really have to solve the problems that come your way, and you can't say, I don't want to work on this because I'm not interested. And this was particularly ironic for me because, as uh, all of you who went to medical school know, there's not much time uh, in the schedule, very little flex. And so when I needed my wisdom teeth taken out as a second year medical student, I decided that I would skip the two days on the male reproductive tract uh, because I was pretty sure I didn't want to be a urologist. And uh, so then when this happened, I had to go back and get all those textbooks out again and try to learn something about the anatomy and physiology of uh, semen so that I could try to work on solving this problem. And as uh, you may know, we eventually developed another animal model, a rabbit model, which is frequently used in reproductive toxicology, and we were able to show that in a time and dose-dependent fashion, vector is cleared from the semen, and we did a lot of other studies that demonstrated that it's actually very difficult, if not impossible, to transduce spermatocytes with AAV, and so that we... we we're eventually able to assure ourselves and trial participants and the regulators that uh, we could amend the trial to mitigate this risk by encouraging barrier contraception until the vector sequences were no longer detectable. And then we were excited after a year to get the trial back on track. And now we advanced up to the doses that had been shown to be effective in a dog model of hemophilia. And when we reached this dose of 2 times 10 to the 12th, we did see therapeutic levels of factor 9 being expressed in this patient uh, for a period of several weeks. And then uh, we saw that the dog model had actually accurately predicted the therapeutic dose, and then expression was gradually lost uh, over a period of weeks. Not only that, but we also saw another phenomenon that we had not seen in mice, rats, rabbits, hemophilic dogs, or non-human primates, and that was a rise in the liver enzymes, the ALT and the AST, uh, which slowly came up and then slowly came down, and that paralleled the loss of factor IX expression. So some of you have heard me talk before, and, and you may wonder, why does she always show that slide? I have to say, this was some of the longest two weeks of my life. Uh, we had no animal data to guide us. The physician taking care of this patient, and the patient was also a physician, uh, resided in Australia, in Helen's part of the world. And uh, he typically got his lab data around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then he would call me, and it was 2 o'clock in the morning in Philadelphia, uh, to let me know what was going on. He would always start the call by saying, oh, did I wake you? <laughs> no, no, I was waiting by the phone for you to call. Uh, anyway, so fortunately, this was a self-limited 
asymptomatic transaminase elevation, but then we did need to figure out exactly what was going on. And this really can be, I'm sorry to say, simplified into a, a discussion that only takes one slide to show. And that is that uh, when you think about it, AV vectors from a genetic engineering standpoint act as a highly ordered set of proteins that access receptors on the cell surface and then the, the, the particle eventually uncoats, the DNA goes to the nucleus and it starts uh, directing the synthesis of factor IX. However, viewed from an immunologic standpoint, this vector has been engineered from a virus that the immune system has previously encountered and we really need to understand the immune responses to the recombinant virion, which, does, which looks like a virus from the outside but does not drive the expression of any viral proteins so that we can manage the immune response and achieve long-term expression. And this really started uh, a series of investigations in our laboratory to try to characterize the human immune response to, uh, to recombinant AAV virions, both the neutralizing antibodies that uh, affect uh, many of the adult population, as well as the delayed cellular immune response. And much of this work was led by Federico Mengozi in the laboratory, and, and it unfolded over a period of years, but it gave us a much better handle on what was going on. And when we wrote up the data from that first trial, uh, we outlined this hypothesis that when the vector goes into the cell, uh, it uncodes the DNA, goes to the nucleus, that's exactly what you want. But much of the capsid can be left behind in the cytosol, undergoes proteasomal processing, and then is transported into the ER where it can be loaded onto MHC class one molecules, making the transduce hepatocyte a target for circulating CD8 T cells. And we developed a number of reagents that we were able to use to really help us uh, uh, delineate exactly what was going on. Uh, there was a lot of interest in our uh, data, but one thing that we did predict was that a short course of immunomodulatory therapy may be able to block the immune response uh, until the capsid-derived sequences were cleared and that then that might allow long-term expression. So um, there were many other theories advanced to explain our findings, uh, but the the hypothesis that it was due to the preformed capsid predicted that short-term immunomodulation would work. And uh, fortunately for us, our friendly competitors at University College London and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital read our paper and incorporated uh, a provision into their trial to give a short course of steroids if they saw something similar. And when they reached the same dose where we had seen this phenomenon, 2 times 10 to the 12 vector genomes per kilogram, they saw a similar effect. And, and with this very slight rise in the transaminases and the drop in the factor IX level, they instituted a course of steroids. This rescued part of the immune, uh, part of the factor IX expression. And we had the opportunity to study cells from these patients, and we were able to show that the immune response we had seen also occurred in their trial uh, at about nine weeks after vector injection, you saw a marked rise in the number of capsid-specific circulating peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Um, out of six patients who got this dose, four of them required a course of steroids, and the group at uh, St. Jude and UCL did note that you could lose expression uh, in the time that you're waiting for the steroids to kick in. And so uh, we were able to, so, so when we got to Spark, uh, we hypothesized that if we could make a more efficient vector, we might be able to avoid this response and get better results. And so for this work, we undertook to use as our transgene a naturally occurring variant of factor IX that carries a single point mutation at arginine 338 that confers about a four to eight fold increase in the specific activity of factor IX. And so Chavi Angela and our group, first at CHOP and then at SPARC, developed this uh, codon optimized vector expressing this factor IX variant that had originally been described by a group in Padua, Italy, working with Valder Aruda uh, in our group at CHOP. 
And uh, so we introduced this vector into a clinical trial, and this shows the results in the very first patient that uh, we studied. And you can see that after vector injection, he has a smooth rise to a plateau level of around 30%, and uh, that this was a result that we were able to repeat uh, throughout the trial. And those data were published late last year. Um, and the range of circulating levels, and a couple of these people did have immune responses uh, that we treated with steroids. But as a group, there was a very marked reduction in the annualized bleeding rate, a 97% reduction accompanied by a 99% reduction in factor use among these first 11 subjects. <clears throat> the safety profile was excellent. Uh, with the most common adverse events being trials of uh, life, not anything related to the vector, no serious adverse events, and no development of inhibitors. Uh, there were two patients who were put on steroids out of those first 11, but on the whole, it was a very positive uh, study. And I am happy to say that similar results have now been published by other groups as well, and Phase three studies for hemophilia B are underway, uh, sponsored by uh, Bayer Moran, and in the planning stages from other sponsors as well. So it's a very exciting time in terms of hemophilia gene therapy. And I think, to me, a most exciting aspect of gene therapy in 2018 is illustrated here. Other trials that uh, are providing new therapeutic options for people born with very serious diseases like spinal muscular atrophy type 1. This is a study uh, by Jerry Mandel and Brian Casper and their colleagues. It started at Nationwide Children's Hospital and then moved to Avexis. Other exciting results in the field shown here, a collaboration between Marina Cavazzana and her group uh, at NECARE along with the group from Bluebird. So these are addressing very large diseases, genetic diseases that affect the population. So typical of these trials was also our finding at Luxterna. I felt like it really took two villages to move this product. First in academia, which really substantially de-risked the work involved in the trial. And then in industry, our group at Spark to get it across the finish line which all my commercial colleagues remind me to them, that's not the finish line, that's the starting line. But so whether you work in academia or whether you work in industry, and as all of you know, because you've lived it and you've done it, it is no small thing to have contributed to the beginning of a new class of therapeutics, especially one that has such extraordinary power to alleviate human suffering. The best part of this for me has been the privilege of working with people who are super bright, who think outside the box, and who don't give up when things look discouraging. I have been amazed at the creativity and the insights of my scientific colleagues and the courage and the calm of a number of my clinical colleagues who have really brought gene therapy to patients. And I have been especially amazed at the courage of patients and their families to step off into the unknown uh, and uh, who have shown their willingness to participate in gene therapy trials and have shown the generosity of spirit to recognize that they might not achieve every therapeutic outcome that they had hoped for, but that their participation in the trials will help someone else further down the line. So when Luxterna was licensed, the FDA held a press conference and I was amazed to hear the FDA commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, make the following statement, which I've certainly believed, but I didn't know that he did. I believe that gene therapy will become a mainstay in treating and maybe curing many of our most devastating and intractable illnesses. And so uh, I think that this title, which I don't know whether Michelle Sadlan or Cindy Dunbar came up with this, or maybe it was the editor of Signs, but I think that we are really all witnessing now gene therapy coming of age. And so it only remains for me to thank my many colleagues at Spark uh, for uh, their contributions to the work on RPE65, to thank Jean Bennett, who tirelessly led this work through all the phases that were involved, Albert McGuire and Steve Russell, the principal investigators at CHOP and Iowa, 
and our other collaborators in the work uh, on RPE65, and for me, the people who have worked with us on hemophilia, both our clinical trial collaborators at a number of different institutions around the world, my colleagues at CHOP, uh, our immunology colleagues at WISTAR, and a group at St. Jude uh, University College London. So thank you all very much for your attention. And uh, if Helen is agreeable, I guess I can take one question. Thank you, Kathy, for a truly wonderful talk. I think we can take one or two questions, if anyone has any. Um, if not, thank you again, and anyone who wants to come and talk to Kathy can come up to the podium afterwards. Thank you very much.